All right, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Thomas Keegan again with LibertarianProgressive.com. Uh, this um, August 31st on Friday afternoon, I have um, uh, Thomas Jefferson here uh, uh, running for Congress in the 4th District of Kansas uh, to help restore our Constitution. Uh, just to set the stage, if anyone's going to listen to this 100 years from now, I mean, it's uh, 2012. It's about two months before our election day, um, which will be on November 7th, 2012. And, um, and basically, right now at this time, um, uh, regardless what the history books might say then, uh, our Congress has a 10% approval rating, which is a record low. And uh, for the last 20 years, we've been electing the, um, the, the, the lesser of two evils. And now we're at a point where um, our campaigns, we can't even, we're in a two-party system, and, and, and it's, it's, it's almost like we can't even tell the difference between uh, those two parties. But um, on the ballots, there are uh, al alternate selections that we can choose. The, the main thing is people need to know all their options so they can make a fully informed decision. And so there are other parties, independent people running. Um, hopefully this will be a year where there's a wave of, uh, of fresh um, ideas and, and people that have um, uh, an historical sense of uh, the principles of our Constitution. And I'm talking to someone here. And, uh, and with a somewhat famous name is Thomas Jefferson is one of the um, authors of the Constitution. I think along with John Adams might have helped or some other people might help, but, but he's known for writing the Constitution. And uh, so, um, Mr. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, it's a pleasure. And um, I feel like, you know, now this, this might be the year, um, now that we have Thomas Jefferson r running for Congress in 2012, that, that this might be the year where, um, y y you know, I guess the republic strikes back. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, good afternoon, Tom. How are you today? Great. Excellent, sir. Thanks. So the uh, Thomas Jefferson Project is more than just my campaign. It's actually uh, a movement to vote for the person and not for the party. And I think one of the problems that we've seen over the uh, past 20 years that you were talking about is that people have gotten into a habit of voting for the party, voting along party lines. And I feel that this creates divisiveness in Congress because bicameral doesn't mean a two-party system. It means two house. Right. That's what we're supposed to have, an upper and a lower house, and fairly well evenly mixed of uh, representatives from the United States House of Representatives, which I'm running for, that uh, actually represent their constituents, their people. And I don't see, and the Congress, they're getting in a cycle of run, rinse, repeat, and they're not necessarily, I think, representing the constituents or the will of the people. And the way I like to point that out is, uh, if you look at a political map that any of the pundits put up on television or such, they have red states and they have blue states, but our country is red, white, and blue. And we, we need to realize that the third largest party in the United States is the Libertarian Party, and the choice isn't only Democrat or Republican, but there are other people on the ballot. And get to learn your candidate. Don't just say, well, I always vote Republican, so this year I'm going to vote Republican again, because if the Republicans are in control of the House, then our life will improve somehow. Yeah, it's kind of like individual rights. Uh, I mean, it, it's the same principle, um, you, you know, instead of collective rights. Um, I mean, because what could be the, 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 the strongest kind of rights um, a collective could have is each individual having those rights. And um, in the same sense, uh, you know, vote for the individual instead of the party. Um, I, I mean, uh, that seems like common sense, another thing our country was built on. That's not as common as you would think any longer. Now, I, I went on the uh, Kansas um, uh, Secretary of State page. I, I mean, they, I guess they don't have all the candidates listed yet, but uh, hopefully they, they, they do. Um, that would be, you would think that would be one of the most informative things that could be on, um, you, you know, their elections page. But let me ask you real quick before we get started here. Obviously, that you're a, um, a Navy veteran, and, uh, and so you're obviously from Kansas. What got you motivated? Um, is this your first time running? I mean, I guess because something, you know, not everyone 
just goes out and decides to run, you know, third party or independent, um, you know, at a whim. I mean, this must have, or maybe you did, but uh, I mean, please let us know. The uh, incumbent Republican candidate uh, in March of 2012 voted in favor of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. The way that it was written and stood that even President Obama, although he uh, also endorsed and signed, so it became, uh, so the act was put in place, uh, he put a signing statement with it. He put an executive signing statement distancing himself, saying, I know that this is the wrong thing to do. That's why, while I'm president, I will never overstep the authority of the office of well, the president. He, he, but he also said he would never do a signing statement either. And there, yep, I, yep, yep. Yeah. So I'm saying that that's, uh, they're not, you know, the things that they're saying are contrary to the things that they're doing. And this is something I've noticed in a lot of the campaigns. But when our representation said it's okay to detain American citizens, that, that, I think that woke up Thomas Jefferson. And I think that's what happened there, was that, uh, because that's in the Declaration of Independence, that was one of the charges pulled out against King George specifically. We need a new government. Why do we need a new government? I'm declaring that King George is unlawfully imprisoning members of these United Colonies, at the time the 13 colonies. And you have to remember at the time, uh, the people that lived in the United States at the time weren't necessarily British royal subjects, but they were being subjected to the British royal crown. Uh, the people had already lived several generations. The United States already had been in place, not as the United States, but as the New World had already been settled for over 200 years and there had been families born and generations raised in the colonies, and they, they were not connected to the British royal crown. And there were also other immigrants from other countries. So they're being subjected to the laws at the whim of King George. And they said, we can't have that government. He, did, and he, he I guess he felt like he owned them, in a sense. And Oh, yeah. yeah. So they, uh, we've pretty much come full circle where you can pretty much take the Declaration of Independence and you can find an act or a law that seems to contradict that which is in the Declaration, which is the statement that says, here's why we need a new government. Yeah, you know, the NDAA, now, the nat every year Congress has a National Defense Authorization Act, but the thing is, Congress sneaks in extra... Um, provisions and extra statutes and, 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 and laws, they attach it to a bill so it, it couldn't stand on itself. So they want to say, okay, so you didn't vote for reauthorizing funds for a military because, um, you, you know, it has all these uh, civil rights violations, these constitutional rights violations. I mean, they, you can't overrun the Constitution without adding a new amendment. But um, if people don't know about the, I mean, you can just... Um, look on the internet glenn greenwald wrote a good article on what the ndaa does but basically yeah you're right it lets the president um it lets the military it, you know uh it kind of gets rid, rid of posse comitatus which was passed after the civil war not to allow the military to police our streets and it allows any um, american citizen it basically declares america a battlefield where they can be picked up and taken away um, without anyone knowing about it indefinitely, without knowing their charges against them, the accusers against them, talking to a lawyer, having a fair and speedy trial of their peers, their uh, the jury, um, and, uh, you know, any oversight, and, and possibly cruel and unusual, I mean, that could be considered cruel and unusual punishment as well. That's not what we do in America. Yeah. And, but, I mean, this is what our government says. Oh, yeah, we definitely should. And, you know, one of the things that's kind of a, a bitter pill to swallow was on September 11th in 2001, you know, there were cowardly and terrorist acts committed on U.S. soil, which this wasn't the first time, but the last time, you know, was, uh, you know, the White House was actually burned, but that was 
Oh yeah, and in the Revolutionary War, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there is a lot of like uh, terrorism and espionage and spying, and they, I mean, we've been dealing with this stuff a long time. I mean, they had to deal with like a Benedict Arnold, and uh, so it's it's there's not you know we have new technology, but the principles there's nothing new under the sun. And I think what hit home more this time than other times was uh, mass media was that we were able to watch it live on TV. And it really mm -hmm. struck a chord of fear uh, in the heart of America and that our government, the people in power at the time, took advantage of this. Now, one of the things that we were told at the time was if you're going to buy a car, go buy that car. If you're going to buy a big screen television, and if you don't, the terrorists win. Right. And the, we, that, what they told us was the reason the United States was attacked was because the other interests are jealous of the United States' lifestyle, of our way of life, that we've become too Western and potentially amoral, and so for their own personal religious gain, they have to strike at the evil giant that is the United States. And that's why the attacks were perpetrated, is the bill of goods that we were sold. Now, on that day, over 3,000 Americans lost their lives in a in just a terrible, terrible act of, of terrorist activity. And it was because we allowed that to foster inside the United States. And the World Trade Center itself had been unsuccessfully attacked a decade before that under the Clinton administration. Right. And, you know, it was, I mean, so I think that they really should have taken the threat a little more seriously. But they destroyed... Oh, there were people warning. I mean, there were people in the FBI um, warning, saying, like, you know, there's people trying to get pilot's licenses that don't want to learn how to land. And, yep. and But they didn't listen to those people. So maybe, you, you know, like they say, they hate us because of our freedom. So, you know, maybe um, let's get rid of our freedoms and they might not hate us anymore. Is that... I mean, that seems like the thinking that Washington passed through. Instead of, hey, how about let's listen to the people that were on the case and maybe promote those people instead of keeping the people let them people keep their jobs that that were asleep at the wheel right and I and I think that was I think that's the the true issue here is that um, people were killed and buildings were destroyed but that's all that the terrorists were able to do they were able to kill some Americans they were able to destroy some buildings and we were told that the United States will not cater to terrorism and we will not change our lifestyle and if we do then the terrorists win because they want us to be terrorized by them but we have changed our lifestyle we have changed yeah. it in the interest of national security we have by the act of the members of Congress and I think right now the average term and this is why like um, presidential candidate Gary Johnson uh, and I very much agree with him in term limits because the people that were in power then are still in power now because they get this run rents repeat cycle yeah, people didn't live that long you, you know <laughs> maybe if yeah. they did they would have had term limits yep yeah. well this is the thing uh, if you look at who has term limits the president of the United States has term limits Governor Johnson uh, actually ran himself out of a job you know, by instilling term limits while he was governor. Yeah, after being popularly elected twice in a row, yeah, mm -hmm. as governor yep. of New Mexico, right? Yep. And this is, you know, like George Washington said, you have to know when to lead, pick up the scepter to lead, and as importantly, you have to have the strength to know when to set it down. So are you running to make a name for yourself, to make a career? I guess not, right? So, I mean... I'm, I don't, I want our country back. I don't want... A, I don't want a political career. Uh, I'm, I'm at the point where I think, you know, I, a lot of the people that support me say we really like you and we would feel bad voting for you because we think it would ruin you that, you know, if you were in office for any length of time. Uh, the, what has happened many, many times before is we absolutely adore somebody. We vote them, they go into office, and then they become corrupted because they, they become part of the establishment and the system. Well, my job is not to go have a political career. I want to go campaign term limits. The big three, you were talking about, you visited my website and looked over 
the and I'm going to be updating the website uh, in September um, to add the big three uh, buttons at the top and the big three yeah, are Jefferson we, for Congress F O R Jefferson for Congress dot com is a website. Yep, and the big three when we post them are going to be we need an, a sustainable energy plan to allow the United States to become energy independent with ten years, and we have that plan. We need a balanced budget so we no longer operate with a deficit, so we get a chance at uh, eventually paying off the debt that we're passing on to our children and grandchildren, and we need term limits uh, combined with campaign reform. But the statement I was um, uh, making with George Washington was that the people that have term limits are like Governor Johnson, President of the United States. People that don't have term limits are like Muammar Gaddafi, Idi Amin, Adam Hussein, Paul Pot, you know, so when you look at the at the people that, that don't have term limits, uh, you look at an oligarchy or uh, a fascist regime, things like that, and their their leadership is staunchly opposed to term limits, and it's because they don't have the wisdom or the strength to know when to set down that, you know, when to set down the sector. Well, freedom isn't free, and, and you can ignore politics, but it's not going to ignore you. I mean, this is... Right. It, 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 people are w wondering, like, um, I mean, this is a direct uh, investment that, I mean, now freedom isn't free, but the best things in life are, like voting. And, um, I mean, if people want to get have a better future, like a better standard of living, um, electing representatives who are actually going to represent you, uh, we the people, um, uh, better than um, your competition, uh, uh, someone who did vote for the... Um, NDAA, uh, Mike Pompeo, um, and uh, so it, that's, uh, I mean, if people want that, that here's a way where people can literally um, improve their, possibly their standard of life, or at least fight for what they believe in. Yeah. Uh, you also, uh, the incumbent also co-sponsored the uh, Cyber Intelligence uh, Security Protection Act, which was... SIPA, killed. yeah. Yeah, which was killed in the Senate, not because of the reason it should have been, which is, you know, that it, it's an absolute invasion of the privacy. And I said, you know, the CISPA was a wonderful bill. The only thing they needed to change about it was that uh, if a person uses a government computer to send or receive electronic data, there needs to be a copy of that that's posted on a publicly accessible website so we get to see their correspondence if they're looking at ours. I mean, you know, just kind of like, show a little bit of reciprocity. Doesn't transparency, I mean, openness, I mean, isn't that what made us strong in the first place? Um, and it's kind of like uh, we can, it, it might have some flaws, but the thing is, with the open debates and share of ideas with a lot of brilliant minds, those flaws will be revealed and um, and there's nothing more scarier to our enemies than someone who's not afraid to admit their flaws and, and, and they will actually be fixed a lot quicker than um, being hidden and, and not having it debated. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so. that's, here's just the thing about going on civil liberties real quick if people don't remember. I mean, I, I made a list of like uh, civil liberties that, 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 that we, we have that, that we've, um, that, that are, uh, 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 not not ex extinct, but are endangered. I guess to kind of use that analogy, they're endangered. We need to grow these back. Um, uh, to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. To not experience illegal searches and seizures of our property, personal records, requiring an independent judge's approval under oath. The right not not to incriminate yourself. To if charged with a crime, to know the charges, evidence, accuser, as well as being accountable to a jury of your peers, have a right to a fair, speedy trial, um, competent counsel, no cruel and unusual punishment, due process, not to be forced to purchase something from a private organization, um, the right to exercise free speech, um, to protect yourself, bear arms, property rights uh, against eminent domain, um, and being used by the military, posse comitatus, the right to vote. Um, and, uh, I mean, do you... Now, a lot of people separate, like when Ron Paul was in the debates, for example, they try to separate foreign policy from our economics. I mean, do you think there's a case to be made that our economic policy 
and I'm just asking this, I mean, you might not have thought about this, but it, could, could our economic policy be, be based on, uh, be somewhat based or have a relationship to how we uh, uh, recognize civil liberties? Yeah, and um, yeah, definitely. And I think part of that has to do with the taxation. One of the things that's been said, and it, it's becoming more increasingly apparent, is that the shrinking middle class, and I think this is why we have a deficit and why we have accrued this debt, was our middle class is shrinking, and the middle class is who has always borne the bulk of the uh, tax. Um, those that are not well off pay, in effect, a tax rate of zero percent. And uh, I've seen a lot of people that they're in low income and then they get uh, income tax return based on the number of children they have on earned income credit. So they actually, you know, pay an effective tax rate of zero and also get a return. Um, and, you know, the idea behind that was to help children and help get health care and health insurance and such, which they don't have. Uh, and then those that are wealthy like Warren Buffett, they essentially figure a number that they're comfortable with paying, and then they just make the tax attorneys and accountants use the tax law and the tax codes to fit the bill for the way that they pay it. So, Yeah, and a lot the of the companies, you think about that Warren Buffett is investing in, were bailed out companies too yeah and the other thing and this is a, a huge concern to me is Warren Buffett was a teenage boy and his father took him to the New York Stock Exchange and gave him money and said uh, you can buy what you want you know you can make your own trades today and he made front page headline news and uh, became this whiz kid on Wall Street because that on that day the stocks that he picked uh, actually made substantial gains and they made money and so it became this uh, sounds like you know, Jack like, and the Beanstalk or something <laughs> yeah like he was a, like he was a savant and he was some type of uh, magical whiz kid that knew everything about the stock market for no good reason other than he you know just had the power and so when Warren Buffett would speak even from an early age people would lean over and listen like they used to do with the E.F. Hutton commercials you know, but that, that people actually did that with Warren Buffett. And when asked, what's your secret, he said, buy what you know and everything and anything American. And that's my secret. And so, you know, he owned half of Coke and half of Pepsi through Berkshire Hathaway. And they would buy American companies. And brands you would know, like you, you, you reach for a Coca-Cola and you say, well, I know this brand. But, if, you know, maybe you wouldn't be as familiar with Royal Crown Cola or an other brand. You buy the one you know, and you everything American, anything American. But four years ago, I think it was now, uh, he got a one and a quarter page letter from a company in India that wanted a four billion dollar investment. And for the first time ever, he left the United States on an airplane. In his eighty three some odd years, he had never been outside of the United States. He flew to India, met with the people, gave them the four billion dollars, came back grabbed Bill Gates and flew to China and then invested another quarter of a billion dollars in a, in a company in China. That's four and a quarter billion U.S. dollars leaving our market and going to invest in India and China. Technically, they were both in China because the company from India wanted to build a factory in China. And uh, to me, that's when the everything American, anything American, buy what you know guy is investing in a company with a name he can't pronounce in India to the tune of $4 billion it makes me wonder why wasn't there something that was as lucrative and as advantageous for him to invest the $4 billion on in the United States? Why is he taking this money overseas? And he got the money from us. We bought the Coke and Our Federal Reserve, um, un under um, par the, the partial audit that they got, revealed that um, out of the $15 trillion that they had lent out, um, a, a big portion, I think 25% or so, was um, lent out to foreign banks as, as well. Uh, yeah, European Union, I think. Yeah. But, um, I mean, in the United States... And, and we pay for, you, you know, having bases in West Germany <laughs> and, and South Korea. That probably helps their local markets. And, and I would, yeah, absolutely it does. 
Um, we need to have a presence. Here's the thing. We need to get out of Afghanistan. It's too much money, and we're not helping anybody. And this was a lesson that the Soviet Union learned when they bankrupted themselves. This was like the nail in their coffin. Uh, there was a movie, Charlie Wilson's War, that kind of sums up how the United States um, economically undermined the Soviet Union by training the people we're fighting now uh, to oppose the Soviet occupation. And the United States, we apparently didn't learn this lesson from watching the uh, Soviet Union. Afghanistan is just like this horrible, hilly, barren country that's full of people that are very tribal, that live in little groups and sects, and they fight amongst themselves. And it's been this way. Go back and read your Bible and read about Babylon, which is just south of Baghdad, about 60 kilometers or so. It's gone now, but it was there then. Yeah, and too bad a lot of their museums and stuff were broken into and all those artifacts were, you know, destroyed or lost. Yeah. But the, in the writings, Babylon was destroyed by warring tribes. You know, I mean, when you look at the writings in the Bible and you look at their different tribes, and it's just a, a family that grew to a large size, that grew to a sect, and then they all populated a certain region within the same country. And they fight amongst themselves. To Today, they do. And it was that way at the time that people like Moses were riding on goat pelts. Well, uh, I mean, we're spending a lot of... I mean, money does equal time. It does equal energy. Uh, I mean, people could say, you know, we're spending money, we're also spending lives, but that money does equal, uh, like, our um, standard of living, how much our dollar's worth. Um, I mean, being in debt, basically, is just... Uh, it's a tax. It's a transfer of wealth, because if other people are getting more of these inflated dollars, um, it's just another way to transfer wealth, basically. And um, I mean, because the, the, the debt is going to be paid to somebody, right? And um, and someone's going to get that money somewhere. Um, and uh, it, it, it's it's financial warfare in a sense, if it was purposeful. But it seems like we're doing this to ourselves. I, I mean, I, I I think a lot of people would agree that we've been there too long. We've been there longer than any other war ever in in Afghanistan right now. And we didn't learn, and we're not. It's just it's time. Now, as far as other bases that are in uh, South Korea, bases that are in Germany and like that, it was incredibly important that the United States uh, became involved in Kosovo and in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and it saved, there were already hundreds of thousands of lives lost and uh, numbers that were even up to the millions of Serbians that were killed, like 1.2 million. And the, we said, well, we're the United States, we're, you know, we're not going to get involved in an other conflict in Europe. And then it came to a point where the United States had to become involved as a humanitarian effort. So when the United States did, we went in, uh, everybody came to uh, an understanding as to where their new borders were going to be. They all kind of agreed with it and lived with it, and it's tense, but it's stable. This is never going to happen in Afghanistan. It's not the same thing, and the good that we did when we interceded in Europe since World War II until present, that doesn't, it doesn't translate to the culture that's in the Middle East that have had tribes warring since the time of the Old Testament that were written about. I mean, we pretty much completed our objectives within the first couple of years, right? It's they, just said that they, said, they said we have to go get Saddam Hussein because he harbors terrorism, has weapons of mass destruction, and he is a threat to the world. Well, we got him. They said we need to get uh, Osama bin Laden because Osama bin Laden is also harbors terrorists and was responsible for the attacks on September 11th. Although probably not directly, as it appears now, he definitely had some involvement and funding efforts. Maybe we him. should have gotten him first, you know, and, um, yep. and and see what the situation looked like after we did accomplish that. Um, well, yeah. we got them both. So we got them both. Why are we there? Yeah. We, yeah. We, uh, the two things that 
Well, we for were oil, happy. I guess, um, and that goes to your energy thing, and it it's all, it all relates, right? So, I, I mean, so I mean, is is it? Do, do you think? I mean, if there wasn't oil there, would we? Do you think we would be there? Uh, probably not, but we're not necessarily benefiting from that oil. A lot of that oil is going to the new burgeoning economies, like in India and China, and they're the ones that are buying up the the production of a lot of the oil fields in the Middle East. So um, we do buy from there also, but we're, we don't buy the lion's share of that. that. That's actually, and so in a way, we're protecting the interests of China when we're there. Oh yeah, and, and like we bailed out GM so they could build factories in China too. So yeah, yeah we're. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know who didn't take out the bail? Who didn't take bail out money at least directly? Was Ford. Right, I do remember and, that. And, uh, you know, I applaud them. I, I never liked Ford products at all, and I bought a Taurus not that long back. Well, it's I think years. a lot of people got a little bit better admiration for Ford after they, they refused that, actually. Um, I, I, I did, too. I, I did, too, and I, I noticed their stocks went a, a little bit up. And, uh, yeah, I, I definitely do admire them a little more for that. Absolutely. But uh, I think that we need to get back to... Uh, Innovation. We need to do the invent, baby, invent. As and well. Henry Ford actually was a great American, and um, so I mean that's a good tradition there too. Yep. No, you don't. You're not. You don't see names like Daimler. You know when you're looking at Ford. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, it's definitely Ford's a, a good family, and they. And I never really liked the product, and then I bought one, and I've had it seven years. Well, Henry and, uh, Ford. I, I mean. Um, to get into some other issues, and you are, I guess, kind of in a farming state, is that correct? Um, in uh, nine, probably 98% of uh, all dollars that come and pass through Kansas are directly related to either agricultural production, the support of the agricultural production, I know there's or the industry of that supports agriculture. Ford trucks, but do you think, um, I mean, maybe I'm off base here, but let me just ask, um, I mean, would it be beneficial to farmers to be able to grow industrial hemp instead of having to import it because it's illegal for farmers to grow, yet we can legally import it to make fibers and ethanol and things like that? And actually, Henry Ford built, I heard, his first car to run off of ethanol that was produced from hemp. Yeah, it was alcohol burning engine. The uh, uh, standard oil was producing kerosene and they had a byproduct that was gasoline heptane is what they called it at the time. And they, we still, it just, it's however many uh, hydrogen to carbon atoms bond to make the molecule. You have heptane and octane and they blend it together. So when you go to the pump, you see 87 octane means 87% of it has the um, eight carbon to 16 hydrogen, and the okay. other is seven is just a heptane. But um, they had this byproduct, which was heptane, and they didn't know what to do with it, so they were digging trenches and burying it, letting it soak in the ground or things like this, which were not. And the EPA was young and burgeoning at the time, and they were willing to sink their teeth into somebody. So uh, Standard hired a guy named Otto, his name was O-T-T-O, to design an internal combustion engine that could take advantage of the heptane, and then Ford was able to secure funding uh, as long as it used the internal combustion engine that could burn heptane instead of alcohol. So at that point, their production engines used uh, uh, what we would consider to be about a 60-octane fuel now that was just uh, heptane with a little bit of lead added as, as a knock inhibitor. Well, what can we do? We, I mean, because energy is important. I mean, it's if the reason why, one reason why, I mean, besides our devaluing dollar is um, energy prices, uh, because a lot of our transports um, uses uh, gasoline and, um, and that will, you know, if the gasoline prices increase, so will uh, everything else, um, like uh, the groceries that are delivered with that transport and, and, and so on, everything. Um, so energy, I, I've heard for a while that we're going to be energy independent, um, and we, we were at one point. But what are your um, ideas uh, that you would champion to uh, start the debates and, and, and start some policies on getting uh, America to be truly um, energy independent? Well, we sat down and gave this thing a thing. And we came up with 10 technologies that should be commercialized, but currently aren't being commercialized uh, to get the United States energy independent 
over a 10 year period. <clears throat> and uh, the energy plan will cost $3 per tax paying citizen in the United States and those same tax-paying citizens that shouldered the burden of commercializing this 10, ten different technologies get uh, a return of $1.20 per year for 10 years beginning in year two. So more than pays and, for itself, okay? Yep. And uh, that, that's the, whenever we look at anything, we have to figure out how is it going to fit in the budget, what's it going to cost, and it's just something like, uh, I don't even remember the name, the solar panel fiasco with President Obama where it, you know, the people get the government grant money and then they go belly up. and Yeah, they went completely belly up. Yeah. Yep. Well, this is the thing about this plan is um, out of the 10 uh, technologies commercialized, uh, it's 10 vertical legs supporting this plan. Nine of them can fail, and the taxpayer is still going to get their dollar and 20 cent per year return. Well, so, I'm on suspense here. Um, yeah, th so at least you have 10, so that's a lot. Um, well, the, the the highlights on the list are we need uh, more conductive lines in the commercial power grid uh, that are better at handling heat and conducting electricity because a lot of the coal that we burn just goes to heating the power lines. And they don't need to be heated. It's just it's a function of resistance, Ohm's law, when you energize these lines electrically. Uh, a certain amount of the electricity is converted to heat because of resistance. But you still need to generate the heat. I mean, it, you st it still comes out of the system. You still so it's, the it's being lost, uh, in other mm -hmm. words. It's not as efficient as it could be. Right. And this is, uh, back in 2004, there was a tree that fell on a power line somewhere in, in New Jersey. And the eastern seaboard was without power for two weeks. And then other parts were without power as long as two months. And, I mean, it was just a cascading failure that started with one tree and one power line, and it wound up becoming a cascading failure throughout uh, a large part of the eastern seaboard of the United States back in 2004. Yeah, and a lot uh -huh. of these things we don't have backups for, like transformers, and uh, and, and they're vulnerable to um, electromagnetic waves and things like that. And we can use this more conductive burial cable, and it makes the infrastructure uh, more secure, less prone. If there were to be a terrorist attack in the infrastructure, this would help safeguard against it. It would have to be a more sophisticated attack than just cutting a suspended line or knocking down a utility pole that has lines on it or whatever. But um, then, like you just touched on with transformers, uh, a second leg in that is that there is a new type of smart transformer that was developed at the university level, and the transformer, the smart transformer, handles loads and works better than the traditional transformers that we've had. And again, you'll see a gain in the commercial power grid just by not having the loss associated with the way that the current dumb transformers are designed. We also have uh, external combustion engine, which is uh, replaces the internal combustion, and uh, I. There, there are two designs of an external combustion engine that I'm really excited about. One of them has one moving part, and the other one has no moving parts. So it's, you know, difficult to get. Uh, I'm going to have to Google that. Yeah, I never heard of an external combustion engine, so that's new uh, to me. That's oh, no, 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 no. If you've ever seen a steam locomotive, you've seen an external combustion engine. Oh, okay. All right. They've had them since the time of the Greeks of Karen used to use external combustion engines to run doors in temples and such. I'll have to inform myself on that. Yeah, it sounds pretty neat. Yep, and uh, Jay Leno has an old Stanley steamer he drives around in Burbank sometimes just to show off that's external combustion. The problem was at the time that the external combustion and internal combustion engines were competing, nuclear power plants, external combustion, um, co-generated coal steam plants, external combustion, those are all examples of external. We use them. We just don't use them in the transportation sector any any longer. They went to diesel trains and internal combustion automobiles. Um, but there is a new alloy that uh, is becomes magnetic when it's heated. And if you wrap a coil around it, and this has already been accomplished, I'm not talking about, you know, this is 25th century Buck Rogers stuff. I'm talking about they have, the it's done and it needs commercialized. Smart transformers exist, they need commercialized. 
how they conduct these lines exist. They commercialize. Now, how would you uh, help commercialize some of these? Um, I mean, what's preventing them from being commercialized now? Because that sounds very exciting. I guess special interests are possibly, that could be one reason. The H1N. Immigration work visas where we import the brain trust and that's what the United States has been doing. U U.S. companies have become lazy and do not do research and development. Henry Ford, you were talking about, he did research and development in his barn. And he actually, and it's kind of a funny story, but he built the car and it was beautiful and he said, I love this car. And then he went to drive it out and it was too big to fit out the door because he brought the parts in one at a time. And <laughs> You know, assemble the thing, so we had to actually cut the door larger to get the car out. But, you see, he was thinking about the car, and he built it. And this is research and development. He had to try several different combinations before he got something that actually worked. And he took the money out of his own pocket, and he did a little bit by a little bit until he had a whole workable automobile at the end of the day. And other people saw it and said, I, I want that. There's then, a lot less of that nowadays. I mean, there's so many regulations. I mean, per, first you probably have to get a permit, and then you'd have to, you, you know, establish a corporation and, and, and sign all these, you know. I mean, a lot less or more reasonable regulation could probably help people, too. That's true. Um, some, areas, some areas do need deregulated to assist entrepreneurs to stimulate this. But um, it's the companies themselves, it's the big companies that can afford the research and development, and they don't do it. They take people from overseas, and they hire them from overseas universities. They bring them here on their work visas. They exploit their intellectual brain trust, and when the visa expires, they go home. And they take home with them all of that intellectual power and, and brain trust that was brought into the company. I mean, think of Einstein, and here's another reason why um, the civil liberties matter, because what's going to make someone want to come here? I mean, it's going to be because it's a land of um, freedom, right? Albert Einstein didn't um, immigrate or flee to, um, you know, any place else but here. And that, that's the thing. Uh, if you know anybody from Mexico, Canada, United Kingdom, uh, Brazil, Venezuela, anywhere. Just take them aside real quick and say, you got five seconds to answer this question. You can never go to your home country where it's the only other place you want to be. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I think everyone can hear that in the back of their mind, the answer there. Um, and uh, and, we, and we want to maintain that. We want the United States to keep that. The reason people come here is because the United States is the largest economy. It's the second largest economy behind the European Union, but the European Union is uh, like combining the gross domestic product of several nations. So, I mean, by far the United States, as far as a single economy of a single country, is the largest, and that's why people come here, because they still want to get the U.S. dollars and the American dream and so on and so forth. And it's a great place to be. And we need to not disturb that. But at the same time, what they did, and you were talking about deregulation, shale fracturing technology to get natural gas, Dick Cheney is vice president of the United States, uh, forced the EPA to sign off on not requiring the Clean Water Act to apply to shale fracturing. And the reason was, if the chemical, and what, it, what, it, what that means is that the companies that produce shale fracturing chemicals do not need to disclose what chemicals that they're using. Okay. And his argument was, um, it's a trade secret, and if we have to disclose it to the EPA, then other companies outside of the United States will try to more cheaply make the chemicals and undercut us. So if we don't have to disclose that, it maintains the intellectual property, and we can make money from it. It also and sounds the, like um, they're trying to avoid any liability, too, possibly. And that's, that's what it wound up actually ultimately happening, is that um, it, it turns out that there's a lot of stuff that you really don't want to use. So I think that they should need to disclose it. But, the, you know, it was kind of a mixed bag. What happened was the deregulation stimulated our economy as far as shale fracturing and like 10,000 wells were 
it almost overnight came into existence in the United States because it's profitable to get the natural gas uh, using the shale fracturing technology. But at the same time, it seems to that they did it so fast, so much, and the money was so much there that they didn't think about the people that have to live around these wells and then the and impact that they're suffering. No, I, I think a lot of people can um, empathize with that. I, I mean, um, imagine, you know, living uh, on, on your land that you might have lived on for a long time and maybe generations, and, you know, now the wells are, um, y you know, the water you get from them, you can light on fire and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, it's uh, what. What about d taxes? I mean, um, you, you know, do you uh, do you go with the fair tax as well, or do you have your own ideas for taxes, or um, what do you think about uh, it? Before we talk tax, uh, we need to talk treasury notes. Yeah. All right. And that's the thing is we need to get away from the Federal Reserve notes, and we need to get the issuance and contraction of currency under control of the Treasury Department, and and the Federal Reserve note. Again, this was uh, kind of a throwback to the Civil War. Right, Abraham, Abraham and Lincoln did that. Yeah. Well, and we've had Treasury notes for more years in the history of the United States than we've had Federal Reserve notes, and we had gold certificates, you know, and that was the thing was if you look at the history of the private Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and the central bank that was authorized by George Washington back then, I think it was 1880, had a 20-year charter. Um, we've only, three times in our history, we've had a central bank of some type. Uh, the first time was to pay back the war debt um, from the Revolutionary War. The second time was coming out of the War of 1812, which essentially was a continuance or a second war for independence. And then, beginning in 1913, we've operated under the private Federal Reserve Bank system. Once we get our treasury notes and we have stabilized uh, our economy in as much as we're not, we pay interest in the form of bonds that are purchased by the Federal Reserve Bank. There's 12 Federal Reserve Banks and each one of them can independently buy U.S. bonds from the U.S. Treasuries. It brings money to the Treasury. The problem is, is the money came from our government raising the debt ceiling and then the Federal Reserve issues the money and then the money is used by them to buy the bond and we have to pay the bonds back at interest and then the dollar that they issued also is paid back at interest because it's a Federal Reserve note that came from a private Federal Reserve bank and not from our treasury. Yeah, you so, could, how could you ever pay that back? Um, yeah. it, it, it's an impossible uh, revolving door. And, right. uh, and, and, and also what's unfair is, um, you, you know, whether they, they're honest or not, I mean, we don't know. We can only speculate because there really isn't a true audit um, completely. But, um, I mean, having yeah. that much power is like, um, uh, it, it's, it's almost unlimited power, basically. If, I mean, if you have, I mean, to this world, at least, uh, to have that much money, you can, you, you, you can if you're going to bail someone out, you know, you, you, you can have a good um, forecast to see how their stocks are going to go um, as well. So there's a lot of potential for insider trading. I mean, what they do is give these, let these companies um, borrow all these, um, all this money at like almost uh, zero percent. And then all what these um, banks do is they just in return by, uh, I guess, um, bonds and stuff that pay back like a little bit higher percentage rates, um, and then they make free money. And instead of, um, you know, letting people borrow money, and uh, yeah, I mean, we our military is not um, a private corporation, so um, I would say money is just as important. Um, I mean, it only Congress has a right to, uh, you know, distribute legal tender, I think. Um, right. So, yeah, right on as far as that goes. Um, uh, Do you remember what the original, the true Thomas Jefferson said about a uh, central bank in a letter to President Washington when it was being discussed under the Hamilton's suggestion of having the, the central bank? Well, please enlighten me because, yeah, I've, I've read a couple quotes, but none off the top of my head. So He said, if you give me personally, an individual, the control of the money, I can do more damage than any standing invading foreign army 
I will make slaves of the sons and daughters of those that founded this country. Yeah, it's, I mean, debt is, um, it's not just a word. It's, it's not something you can necessarily see. It's kind of like when we're looking at those stars out in the heavens and the cosmos that um, we can't really see them, but we can see the shadows behind them to know that they're there. That's kind of the same as debt. You might not be able to literally see the word debt, but you can see it by people losing their homes and people trying, you know, just in an endless cycle of uh, uh, being in debt, um, uh, mentally, um, morally, uh, it, it all leads together. And, and if we owned our own money, then um, th th I mean, there's a lot we could do, you know. So right. Uh, so now, now that we've addressed the core issue that the private Federal Reserve system, which was sold to the American public in 1913, is a way to control inflation and stabilize the economy, which may have worked up until World War II and served that function properly. Uh, we need the private Federal Reserve banks can stay exactly like they are. And that's fine. And, you know, people talk about in the Fed this and that, and going on the gold standard. Well, the two problems with that is we don't have an accurate audit of the gold in Fort Knox, so we may not have any gold. So we don't, you know, until we have that audit, we don't know that we want to go on the gold standard. And the private Federal Reserve banks uh, do serve a function, and uh, they serve an important function. So we don't want to disseminate the banks. Well, what we do want to do is get uh, treasury notes back, which has worked in the past, and we're at that point again where we would benefit from that. So now that we've cleared up our fiat money, let's go back to taxation. We and it could maybe about. have like a Bretton Woods agreement where there's some kind of gold standard, you know, but not mm -hmm. completely on it. Or maybe, um, you know, banks can't... Sp well, I, 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 just full transparency would, would be, you know, a, a good idea. And um, and I guess you wouldn't be against, like, competing currencies, would you? Uh, no, not at all. There's... And the, the big thing is, is we really want, uh, before anything else, we need an audit of our gold reserve. Because the gold was taken from the American people uh, under Roosevelt, I think, in 1933. They said we need... Yeah, I almost Metal. couldn't believe that when I read that. I mean, yeah, I correct. almost couldn't believe that happens um, until I actually read that. I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, precious metals that are used to trade as a commodity were, uh, and actually, this is kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, if you look at, uh, there was a Max Fleischer cartoon of Superman back from, like, 38, maybe? But he, uh, Superman has to save the train full of gold headed for Fort Knox. And I thought that was just really absolutely interesting uh, that, you know, I mean, this they made this cartoon in the well, Superman, the whole big thing about it was that, because this would have been, today we're like, well, there's a train full of gold, but at that time the people seeing that would have went, oh, that's our gold going to Fort Knox. I mean, in the context of the thing, the train was really important to the storyline because it was the American people's gold going to Fort Knox that he was saving. Yeah, it's so much how the premise is formed. I mean, it's just kind of like right when the media or someone asks you, are you going to vote for, or you might get a polling question, are you going to vote for a Republican or a Democrat? I mean, it's there's so much that we take for granted that's just a knee-jerk reaction. I mean, um, I mean, actually, it's kind of um, refreshing to hear some of your views, I mean, because you seem to have a pretty reasonable policy on fracking and 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 the and energy and um and, and so i mean people you, you know can think for themselves and uh and instead of just going with party lines and, and things like that i mean you're you're the only um uh, non-republican democrat running in in your district so i mean i think there's lots of people that could uh find many reasons to support you and and they don't even have to be in your district because after all you're um running for a kind of a federal office and and so the laws you would champion just like there's a lot of fans of ron paul uh, uh that aren't necessarily from texas you know but right. it's because he stands up uh for um things that are going to affect us all and um and uh, so yeah, I mean, you're definitely running against someone who ran for the, who who voted for the NDAA. To me, that is kind of a line. It should be a line in the sand. I mean, if someone could uh, 
I've not, um, you know, stand against that. So, I mean, basically, they broke their oath to the Constitution. Okay, now here's the thing, and um, le I want to keep the topic on the taxation right. because I wanted to uh, explain that we need to, first thing we need to do is stop using the fiat money, but then we'll get back to because it's a whole. It's the I was talking about one of the big three is the balanced budget. The balanced budget includes that we need to do treasury notes and we also need to restructure the way that we do taxation in order to get there. I mean, there's there's a couple of things we have to do. It's not, you, you can't just do one thing and then next year you're fine. We're, too, we're beyond that point. I mean, maybe at some point within the past two decades we could have done one thing and next year we're okay, but we're way past that. But the my uh, incumbent Republican opponent that I'm running against, um, he uh, Essentially, he saves nuns and puppies from burning buildings. He's a deacon at a Presbyterian church. Teaches Sunday school. Um, is on the board of directors at the YMCA. Comes back from Washington to help the farmers cut wheat, which is a big thing in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, so people are enamored with him. They really like him. He's also a multimillionaire. Uh, had a uh, company that he um, raised up. But you were talking about a sworn oath. He went to the military academy at West Point, graduated top of his class in mechanical engineering, and then he went on to Harvard Law, uh, just like President Obama, came back, uh, was admitted to the bar so he could practice law, and then he was elected to Congress. So three times, he would have to have taken the oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States when he was, just like I was, when you get, you have to take your oath when you're sworn in, in the, what they call a MEP station, mine was up in Kansas City, uh, but when you get indoctrinated into the military, you have to take that oath when he was admitted to the bar, and then when he was sworn into Congress as a freshman. So, to me, this was underscored three times and this is a good and decent man. This is literally a good and decent individual. Right. And yet, when he got there, the thing... Now, okay, on the other side of the coin, and I'm not... I think when the Democrats say, oh, the Republicans are to blame for all the ills, and the Republicans say the Democrats are to blame, I agree with them both. All right. I think they're, I think they're both right. So I don't, I'm not saying that I want to be out you know, name calling or finger pointing or any yeah, of well, it's the Democrats who end up violating our civil liberties and it's Republicans who end up getting us in like all these deficits and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And I think that they're working together to cause these problems. It's like it's the one thing they work together to do. Right. All right. That's because, why they have bipartisanship when it's, 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 it's when it's the worst things that could possibly happen. Yeah. Because Mike Pompeo said, I'm not going to vote for Obamacare. I'm going to make sure that thing doesn't pass and we have to do that and this and all the gridlock. Uh, NDAA? Yeah, I'll agree with the president on that. Sure. Yeah, you know, regardless of what people think or, or the possible consequences in the future and everything this whole country has stood for, I mean, what's he really doing there? I mean, this here's another thing. I mean, comparing those um, uh, stances and um, those principles and, 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 and just getting the job done, I mean, you can like someone, but doesn't mean you have to feel obligated to keep them into Congress. I mean, this is um, about our, 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 our kids and, and right now. And... Um, so, I mean, you can like someone, you don't have to keep them there just because they're a nice person. Yeah, and the the bad side about this, and this is the dichotomy that is my opponent, and this is why I'm running against him, is that he also sits on the board of directors of Coke Industries, which is the second largest privately owned corporation in the world. They're not an evil giant, they're just a giant. But they, and if you look at their record as opposed to a company like Cargill, um, which is their chief competitor and also the the largest uh, privately owned corporation ahead of Coke. So he sits on um, the board of them yeah, while yeah, he's yeah. in Congress? Are you allowed to do that? or? Uh, I don't know. And he also sits on their, uh, they have uh, pet charities that they are doing some conservation in the Conza Prairie, which I, this is great. They need to do this. But he also, and it's because he's a lawyer. He does a lot of legal work on the things for them, and I'm sure it's, it's a deal where he donates his time and all of that. But almost, and I'm not going to say it was um, quid pro quo exactly, but um, 
he received more campaign donations from Coke than they gave anybody else ever. So he's received more campaign contributions from Coke Industries than any other candidate. This is documented. You can, they had to publish everything from 2010. It's out there. But anyhow, he received uh, more campaign contributions, greater number of dollars, and they came from Coke. Coke gives to everybody because they hedge their bets. They think eventually someone's going to get elected, and then we're going to come back and say, remember, we were contributors to your campaign. But they gave him more than anyone else. Uh, he sits on their pet charities, board of directors, and um, the staff that's in his office now, in his office, many of them left Coke when he got elected and went from Coke to go work for him. Yeah, I mean, that's oh. what happens. I mean, people can say, like, oh, I'm not going to let money influence me, but that's what happens. I mean, the, the FDA is a revolving door of um, uh, industry insiders. So is pretty much every single department that we have, um, from the EPA to, um, the, to to financial re regulation industries. I mean, a lot of the people that are in our treasury now are like ex-Goldman Sachs. and. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's that's what we're that, that's the whole purpose of why you're running here. I mean, in, in a sense, I, I, I suppose to because I guess the organization organization that you're trying to support is, um, you know, we the people and and uh, right. the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, because the way as a congressman, the thing that I have to weigh. I mean, yeah. even with Obamacare, I mean, he's not, I mean, from it, I mean, he's given, helped out GE a lot. He's exempted mm -hmm. some companies from having to, uh, you know, be under Obamacare, even though he passed it. Yep. I mean, I guess if it was that great, so, I mean, why would he give exemptions to certain companies? And, and how does that help um, competition? I mean, these big banks that we bailed out, um, uh, think of, uh, why don't people think for a second of the mid-sized banks that could have bought up these big banks, right. you know? And this is the other thing, is that on that bailout, um, it would have been, uh, rather than say, oh, we're going to have to give you guys three-quarters of a trillion dollars, we know you mismanaged it and caused the problem. Here's three-quarters of a trillion dollars to fix the problem. Uh, the people that were being evicted, they could have used that, and uh, then, you know, it, it essentially the federal bailout could have been of the taxpayers. So people didn't have to lose their homes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, I, and then I, the bank, and then yeah. now that these are actually backed securities and are no longer unfunded, uh, toxic uh, mortgage, what were they called? Subprime mortgage backed securities that were being traded. Rather than that, now they can be funded, and then your mid sized banks can buy these mortgages that are no longer toxic, and you could buy them for 80% of the equity, and a lot of these were made loans at 110%. So the large banks that were too big to fail, you're still bailing them out, they're just not profiting from it, and then the taxpayers, the people who had to shoulder the burden of this, don't lose their homes either, and it could have been a win-win situation if it was structured like that. Oh yeah, I mean, to to totally, I, I totally hear what you're saying there. I mean, even, I think Ron Paul alluded to something like that, it it's, it's instead of giving the money directly to the banks, why not give it to the people, and then they would have given it to the banks, and then both parties would, I mean, I guess that just flew right over their heads, um, uh, but I, I doubt it, because supposedly they're, they're probably smart enough to, to, to steal all that money, and they probably knew exactly what they're, they're doing, because, because if the people lost the money, um, now, instead of now, they can buy everything up for pennies on the dollar, and, and then that's 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 the vicious part of the business cycle because you know when it goes up, and and so you can buy money at the low end, and and, and when it goes down, you can sell it before it, it crashes, and then everything else is there so you can uh, accumulate more power and um, and buy everything up for pennies on the dollar. I think that's the reason why they they didn't do that, unless if that truly just went right over their heads, which it seems hard to believe. And part of the balanced budget, big three I was telling you about, is uh, credit reform for people. And one of the things that's held a lot of consumers hostage, and they have to pay higher interest rates or there are things that they can and can't have that wouldn't be a revolving debt, would, but would just be like a line of credit at a bank where they'd be able to do a mortgage on a house is that the credit reporting bureaus that these companies use to determine the credit worthiness, um, the actual formulas used by the credit reporting bureaus are not public. It's, that's not a thing that's, that's publicized for its public. And I think that 
that needs to be made public so that people that actually, because there are some people that got into the subprime category and maybe shouldn't have been, and now we can't do a new house start because of the problem they had with a subprime loan that was written by a too big to fail, and the too big to fail at the time knew they were writing uh, an unsubstantiated, uh, they knew they were writing a bad loan. They knew what they were writing was, was a bad loan, and their goal was they were selling the paper to um, another company that would foreclose on the property. You know, I mean, that was the thing they were really buying was a foreclosed property that just hadn't gone through yet. So I think that we need to do credit reform uh, as well. I mean, there's there are several legs that go into the balanced budget. And I guess that kind of brings us back into the taxation question. Uh, if you're still with me, Tom. Yeah, I, it, it's, I've been waiting for this taxation. Uh, this is um, well. We, we, we kind of keep getting kind of keep getting into the other gray area, but to get back on the taxation. While at, okay, so we do credit reform for the people on the street because um, I I don't have ten thousand dollars in cash, but I might have ten thousand dollars in the bank. And if you look at the bank, the bank doesn't have ten thousand dollars. They only have to have like ten percent of reserve cash or whatever. So, and even that's not real money, that's just they have that much accounted for on their books. And, you know, so a billion dollar bank may have a uh, million dollars cash, you know, and then we, we just haven't, the um, number of dollars that we trade in our economy are fiat fictional made up number money because we haven't ever actually printed that many bills of a, of a high enough value to equal the trillions of dollars in our economy. You know, we only actually have minted or printed maybe $700 billion from the absolute first minting of anything that's U.S. currency until present. Oh, yeah, most of the money is digital. I mean, it's, yep. yeah. It's so we have, we have to address that, and this is the part with the credit reform. So uh, we get people where they have the ability to stabilize their credit enough that they can afford a home again. We have the fiat money being backed actually now as treasury notes so that we're not paying interest back to borrow our own money from the private Federal Reserve Bank system. And we have that stabilized. Yeah, that could be a great thing for this country, a really great thing. I mean, we've had that in the past. It's been a great thing, but go ahead. Yeah. So the next step is we go back and we dig Thomas Jefferson back up, shake the dust off and say, can we tax people's income? And vehemently, undeniably, the answer is no. Yes, they said, yes, you can tax income. But um, they did not look at recompense as income. So if I hire you to come mow my lawn, and I am paying you an hourly wage for an hour of your time, that's recompense for your labor that was directly involved. You're not going to profit from this. I'm transferring my property your property in exchange for the income. I own $20, and you would like to own $20, and I'm giving you recompense, the transference of property in the form of paper currency wealth. Now, at the time, it would have been this much percentage of a precious metal or like that. So the paper money was only representing an actual transference of property and ownership on part of a gold bar and such. So um, that was never... Considered no, that, makes sense. Well, that was yeah. considered as property. Now, income was if you did such a good job, my neighbors come over and say, hey, uh, did Tom Keegan mow your yard? He did a really good job. I say, yeah, he works for me. $35 to do your yard. I put 15 in my pocket and hand you the 20 to recompense you for your time. I just had $15 of income. That's taxable. Okay. Yeah. So it's it was an entirely different economy and structure at the time, and this was never the intent was to tax that income. But it was, I mean, it's constitutional for our government to tax your property. I mean, this was something the founding fathers said, we, we need to raise a standing army and we're going to need to build infrastructure and such. So, yes, you know, as much as we hate paying taxes to King George, uh, you know, kind of our caveat is going to be taxation without representation. So if you get something for your tax money, we can tax you because we're, you know, we're giving you, it's, again, this is more like quid pro quo, you're getting something for something you're giving to us. And we're just taxing on your property. 
So the idea being that if you are enriched more than it, everybody does better. The rising tide lifts all boats. No, that makes well, sense. I mean, now, do you, what about, you, you know, I'm sure you're against, like, eminent domain and stuff like that, right? And, uh, you know, I am against eminent domain. Um, yeah, it's too much of a mixed bag. I'm against eminent domain because for the first time in history, a private foundation that was owned by T. Boone Pickens was issued by a local judge in Texas the authority to use eminent domain for uh, electricity and uh, infrastructure rights through lands that were in a particular county in Texas where the people didn't want to have, uh, like there was uh, water and electrical that had to go through this property. The owner didn't want it, but the Pickens private foundation because they were doing these wind farms they got it yeah there's places i've heard where they say we're going to use this because we need a highway and then three years later they just sit on it and end up building like you know uh condominiums or something yeah. there and so what i'm saying is i'm not opposed to eminent domain when it's used as a governmental instrument to actually provide a necessary service that benefits all of the people that are in a given community you may need need a hospital to save lives. You may need a road to get to that hospital. But uh, I think we've pretty much knocked all the rough corners out at this point in our history, and we have the basic infrastructure in place that we need. And I don't think that eminent domain plays a role uh, today that it once did. And yeah, I it think might not be as necessary it. today. I mean, yeah. it should be a last option, and, and people should be right. justly... Um, funded for it if it if it is necessary um and now property taxes though because of the economy now too i mean there are people who have lost their homes because of property taxes and just that alone um i mean do you think there should be some protections about that or um or maybe um i, I don't know i mean any other i think event, i think at the end of the day eventually you're going to find there are always going to be wealthy and there's always going to be poor and there, there's some poverty that you just can't fix. So I think there's some measures that you just have to stop at a point. And this deals with social responsibility. But if they own their property and, you know, they can do what they want, it, right? I mean... Um, I, think, I think if the people own the property, yeah. uh, you're not at the federal level... If you don't pay your federal income tax, and again, we're talking about taxation restructuring anyway, that can be structured different. So at the federal level, that's something that a congressman can deal with and contribute to, uh, you know, the construction of a bill or something that provides protection for people at the federal level this way. But uh, as far as property owners, that really falls back to the city, county, and state. And uh, it's really up to the people that live in that community. What are the laws that we want to live under locally? Because generally, when unless it's like a bank, bank foreclosure or something, and even at that, it's generally a function of the sheriff of the county in which the property resides. So, you know, this is almost as local as you can get. you got your city and your county. And it's it's generally the sheriff of whatever given county that has to come and, and serve the Well, yeah, I, I agree. That That is more of a local issue. I mean, it, unless if you were talking about making, like, a federal property tax. I mean, so what what, what would be your, um, you, you know, uh, I guess ideal and, and, and more maybe a transitional tax um, policy? Well, I look at the fair share, and one of the things that I have in my because I wrote a Declaration of Independence, but NTS on the end of it, like Independent Candidates Declaration of Independence that I sent out to people, and I can send you a copy if you want to see it. But one of them is that the tax cannot outweigh the gain, meaning that um, if a person uh, owes the tax on the property, uh, as long as there's still a gain over the property, people can't lose that property. Uh, you can't lose a $100,000 home you paid for in a $2,000 tax bill. Okay. You have a $100,000 tax bill, you can lose a $100,000 home. Right, right. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes and that, sense. And that's, and that's the Actually, thing that, that about. right there, that's what I was kind of asking. I mean, that, I guess that answered the question. I mean, that's a good preventive measure right there, like you said. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyhow, the, the gain, the taxation cannot outweigh the gain. 
and that's and that was kind of the thing. It's a fair share tax, but the tax cannot outweigh the gain. One thing else I proposed in that was uh, a cost per trade on Wall Street, um, so that uh, that they have to pay a fee to have the privilege of using the United States dollars to trade their currencies on Wall Street, which is what the people want to do. And uh, it's something that, again, is affordable. Now, and, would that uh, be progressive or, I mean, as far as, like, what, um, you know, how much they trade or, or, or? It's just a per trade. Okay. So if someone does a large volume of then small trades, right. they'll probably pay more than if they do a few large transactions. But it's not, you know, here's the thing. Because there's a lot um, of people that use retirement as, as well and, and invest and stuff like that, too. So. Yeah, but the, the, if they go through a broker or even online, whatever you're doing now, you pay per trade or you somehow pay, you know. I mean, if you watch the television commercials like Scott Trade and whatnot, you know, these aren't free services. It's not, you know, they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. You still have to pay your broker. You still have to pay your fees and your trading. And this would be one additional to that, but, um, you know, the on the other side of that... It's it, kind of like a sales tax, in a sense. Yeah, it's kind of like a sales tax. But either way, and right now there's a big deal on should we be paying sales tax on interstate transactions anyway, like over the Internet. Companies like Amazon.com only have to charge sales tax in select states. Yeah, what do you think about uh, that? That's, uh, do you have, because that is a debate, for sure. You know, I would just, I, I think that, I think we're good. I think that if you have a physical brick and mortar um, building in that state, then the roads and the sewers and the waters go to that building and there's going to be uh, policemen and fire trucks and there's going to be national defense and so on and so forth. So yeah, you should get the state tax in that state state in which the utilities and services are being exercised. But um, as far as trading in between the states, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that the person that is, I'm the recipient of something I purchased from them, and I'm not getting the benefit of all of the local municipalities where they have their brick and mortar warehouse edifice or whatever. Right. So I, I don't think I want to be paying I don't want to pay. I want to pay Kansas sales tax. I really do because we have roads here, and I want them to be well maintained. Yeah, and so I, I, I don't pay, mind paying. I don't want to pay California. sales tax either. I'm right? never going to California. I'm not going. I'm, I may actually go to California. I've been there about <laughs> ten times. I, when I was in the Navy, I was stationed to Thirty Second Street, San Diego, Pier Seven, Thirty Second Street. So, and when you, know, you were I mean, there, you did pay sales tax. Yeah, um, what I was there. Yeah. So, but anyhow, um, but now I'm in Kansas. I want to pay it here. But essentially, the other 49 states can be on their own, and I want to pay it in Kansas. So if I'm, you know, so I get this thing from Amazon, and it happened to come from California, I don't want to necessarily enrich the coppers in California for a purchase that I made here. Now, I don't know. I mean, the other way is a logistical nightmare, but a possibility, and that is that um, a company that sells things on a national level uh, has to know the effective tax rate of every uh, zip code. No, that that, that is a logistical to. nightmare. I mean, I've talked. To, I mean, think of these small businesses that own a website, up and coming businesses. I mean, if they had to adjust their shopping carts to to yeah. to, to, to to do every single zip code, because even in states, different counties might have a surtax on them. I mean, it's yeah, just. And, it, it's and even in Wichita, Kansas, you go. It's a job killer downtown. For sure. it, it's yeah. different. So I, I say that the way we're doing it is probably the best, and that is that uh, if I have a business in Kansas, I make a sale in Kansas, I know the effective tax rate. And when, and I actually have a small business that I started in 1993. And um, the first 10 years, I had a tax abatement. And so the first year, I didn't have to pay only on the state, and it was one, it sounds wonderful, a lot of times you hear about these tax breaks and abatements for the companies and whatever. And, I, and it was probably helpful, but um, the abatement was for the state tax only. I still had to pay the city and the county. But, um, and I think it wound up being like 1%. So instead of having 7% tax, I only charged 6.25 or whatever it was. You know, I mean, it was a 
Some people actually noticed, though, when I'd ring up their cell, I'd say, well, I just saw this same thing, and it was 99 cents, and yours is 97. You know, I mean, <laughs> so I don't know. But the first year, we had a 100% abatement on the state. The second year was 90%, and the third year was 80 all the way down until we hit the current effective tax rate that we've been operating under. But, um, you know, so I didn't mind paying that. And as a new business, in an effort to help out there, we even had a, a, a gradient scale where that we had an abatement for the first 10 years that was, you know, 100% abatement year one down to no abatement beginning on the first day of year 11. And, um, you know, then this is the thing, is the people drove on a public road to my store and had to get out and come in. So I feel like that we were getting something for the tax. Also, I, had a, I have a friend from Baghdad, and they don't pay income tax uh, there. They actually receive um, a stipend from, there's two governments that work in Iraq right now. There's the one that we put up, and then there's still the um, Ba'ath Party. And the Ba'ath Party handles the mineral rights and stipend, like I was talking about the oil that a large part of it gets sold into China and India. Okay, and so they get kind of like Alaska, they get, you know, <laughs> a, an amount. Yeah. Right, they get a stipend based on the mineral rights. And the, the term they use there is rich by his name. And uh, because the larger the family, the more people receive a stipend within the family, and then it, it, it enriches the family. Yeah. So, and also, uh, Iraq is a much more... There are parts of Iraq that are, are really fertile. We always see the shots in the desert and the soldiers that have to deal with the heat and all of that. But there's a large part of Iraq that's really nice. And it's, it has, um, uh, well, it looks like Southern California. And like if you pass by. Uh, uh, yeah, we never know, see those images too often. Yeah. That's true. Well, if you do, just Google Kurdistan. Because Kurdistan is still part of Iraq. And I think people make the confusion that they don't realize that. And... If you see pictures of houses in Kurdistan, it looks just like Southern California. And I mean, it's, and it's also relatively untouched by the war, but Baghdad. Actually, I Baghdad, have Googled Kurdistan. So I was curious about the Kurds. They always seem like they're getting the short end of the stick. So I Googled them, looked them up on Wikipedia, and you're right. You're right. Actually, in that area, it, it does look quite uh, like beautiful scenery, a lot of nice nature. And um, yeah, it looks very interesting. So, but as a general rule, if you're traveling the world, any any country that ends in a stand, don't go there. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, you know, if if you if, if, if you don't want to, if if you want to have a safer trip, that's true. If you want a safe trip, avoid all the a stands, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> and, but yeah. um, so Kurdistan is actually pretty nice. Um, now, so my friend from Baghdad was with me. We actually went and ate um, last night. We had uh, hamburgers, I think, or whatever. But um, he said, I hate to live in the United States because I have to pay tax on everything. He said, in, if we buy a major purchase in Baghdad, we pay tax. But we don't, our income isn't taxed. And also they have free public education all the way up through, um, if you want a PhD degree. The Ba'ath Party has an agreement with the people that they'll pay for their education if they fail two years of the education that the state pays for its mandatory uh, military service. So if they go into the program, it's they either have to complete their education or they have to serve the military. You know, it's it's one way or the other, but they they get to they have to repay, which I think was kind of a nice. But again, they have mineral. They have a smaller population base. And they have yeah, mineral and that's rights. their own choice to do it. I and mean. That's, that's yeah, um, I mean, there's things like that we could do. Like, I mean, if you get a free education, you, you, you know, if you do some military service or something, or like maybe if you get an education, you'd be a doctor in a certain hospital for a couple of years or something like that. So. Yeah, I see President Obama, this is what got under my skin about him. When he was campaigning, uh, originally he said, if you can afford to do some community service, we'll make sure you can go to college. Well, here it is four years later, and I don't see a whole bunch of community service kids getting college educated. You know, I mean, it's just not. I, it's just the thing he said, and then 
And then, oh, then there's so do. many broke. I mean, um, there's. I mean, just Google Obama broken promises. <laughs> I mean, there's about 15 of them. And uh, I mean, he was a constitutional scholar. I actually had some hope that he would have a more reasonable foreign policy and that he would at least, I mean, I might not agree with him on a lot of things, but that he would at least protect our civil liberties. And um, that's been, um, uh, well, it's just, I, I guess people are still waiting. He's, they think he's playing three-dimensional chess or something. I, I, think, uh, I think not, you know, I mean, yeah. he's still- They call it an, they call it an Obama nation. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's still playing the two-dimensional chess, and, and then the three-dimensional is like all the special interests around him. Um, That's true. But anyhow, on the long story short, on the kid from Baghdad, um, he was talking about how wonderful it was back in Iraq and how he wants to go back. State Department won't let him right now, but um, he would like to go back. Well, yeah, at the time in the United States, we didn't have like an income tax either. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, do, is that what you're saying? Like maybe like the conditions aren't right now. It would take a transition, but maybe we could think about, um, you know, get set the conditions right. And actually what you're explaining here would help everybody. I mean, no matter if, 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 if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're middle class, whatever, because mm -hmm. the policies you're talking about, civil liberties, being more free, being more free to pursue uh, your pursuit of happiness um, is what it's all about. So, I mean, we're all yeah. equal under the law. That's one place where we're all equal. And um, and uh, so, I mean, this should help everybody. And, and, and do you think someday, like, maybe a, a just a sales tax might be the way to go? Or Yeah, yeah, I think it would be. But on the, on the flip side of the coin, from the kid who was telling me how wonderful it was in Baghdad before the United States showed up and ruined everything. And I asked him, I said, so there was no war before the United States showed up ever in Iraq. And uh, he said, well, I mean, I said, yeah, you mean, because there's always been war. But the, if you ever want to get somebody, an, an, just an Arab gentleman, find a proper true Arab gentleman and call him a Persian and get ready for a fight. Yeah, actually, I, I mean, Iraq, I mean, before it was invaded, it was known as more, like, probably one of the more sophisticated countries in the Middle East, I, I think. Um, and it was more educated countries, um, even though it had, you know, Saddam Hussein, which, which there's, you know, no one's missing him, that's true. But, I mean, they might have um, toppled him sometime on their cells, or we could have helped them. I mean, you know, France helped us during the Revolutionary War, but they didn't fight the war for us, you know. I don't, I don't think that... See, because the thing was, and this is, I'm still trying to get this coin flipped over, um, he was talking about how wonderful things were in Iraq, and then he said, you pay taxes here, and sure, you have paved roads, and okay, you have police, and okay, you have electricity that works 24 hours out of the day. And, yeah, the list goes on and on. Yeah. But still, you have they come and take the money out of your pocket before you ever get to touch it. And I said, you know what? I don't mind having the money out of my pocket before I ever touch it. If it means, because in Baghdad, if, okay, so you have a sister and the neighbor calls your sister um, lurid, says she's a lurid woman. You can go across the street, shoot that guy in the head. Go to the local police and make a report. I just shot my neighbor in the head. Why would you shoot him in the head? He, with no substantiating evidence of any kind, called my sister a lurid woman. And our house is not that kind of house. And they said, well, you were completely justified in shooting your neighbor. Thank you for making the report. So now we don't have to worry about an investigation that we probably wouldn't have conducted anyway. But he said that the way that they do it, they would call it an orange party. They would throw hand grenades over walls that were built to keep the people apart. And this is before the United States. And the, as a matter of fact, before the United States went into Baghdad, his house was broken into and he was stabbed 13 times when he was 13 years old. Uh. Um, and there was nothing done about it. And I said, well, he said we lost everything else. His father was the surgeon. So, I mean, everything was worked out fine and they had money and they were able to, to recover. They didn't recover anything, but they were able to rebuild. And um, so I said, well, how did you lose all of your money? Was, you know, didn't, your father's very rich and he had money, he was a surgeon. And still, as he, as a matter of fact, that's how I knew about Kurdistan was this guy's dad moved to Kurdistan when the war started. He went to go away from the, from the 
you know, because their house got blown up. As a party, said, well, forget this, I'm going to go where the people aren't fighting, and he moved to Kurdistan, which is still in the country, and he was good fine. But either way, um, I said, well, what did the police do? He said, the police did nothing. And I said, how did you lose everything? Uh, you know, you would have most of the money in the bank and a little bit in your house. He said, no, we keep everything in our house because if you put money in a bank in Iraq, the bank goes under, and they don't have FDIC. You know, they don't have uh, any, there's no recompense for them. Yeah. And then when you go up and say, well, we lost everything in the bank to the government, the government says, we told you to put your money in a bank. Well, well that's a good perspective. I mean, that's very, very interesting. Um, I mean, if, if, you know, a real-life perspective there. Yeah, I mean, those are things to think about. I mean, we don't need to overhaul our country, but, we, I mean, the ingredients, uh, the foundation is there. We can even improve upon, you, you, you know, and we don't have to go back to anything. Um, we can go forward. Um, and, I mean, it could be another, I think some people, and I hate to say it, but I, I think are a little short-sighted about the possibilities that um, could be um, by you know, uh, recognizing our historical rights um, and um, not having illegal searches and seizures, be, feeling secure in, in your persons. Um, and, um, I mean, it doesn't need a complete overhaul. We just need people that are going to represent us. I mean, it, our natural resources are still there. Um, the same people that, you know, created the Internet revolution, the, the same technologies are still there the schools are still there i mean everything's still here it's just being managed horribly and and it is starting to deteriorate but it's not too late i mean um i mean you, we, we, i guess we could there's a fork in the road I, I mean in november 7th we could either go down one road of the status quo and 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 see how much worse things get before we decide to make a change and this would be a revolution, but it wouldn't be an overhaul. I mean, I say that in a, a spirited way of um, people uh, voting, but also participating uh, in town halls, um, sending out flyers, oh. just putting an extra little flyer in a book at, at the bookstore or something, just getting the voice out. Or, right. I mean, imagine, you, you know, a wave of independent third-party people, people that are that believe in the Constitution, that believe in your civil liberties, um, that are going to represent you, I mean, locally as far as, like, fracking goes, and, uh, and you, you know, someone who's open-minded, who's, I mean, to me that's the most important part, whether we all agree or not, is, is you know, how willing someone is to listen and, and debates and, um, and how thoughtful they are and, 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 you know, how thoughtful they are before they agree to sign bills and stuff like that and um, introduce them. I mean, we could be on the verge of, uh, hopefully, um, I mean, 2012, November 7th could be, you know, I mean, it would be revolutionary to hear, like, you know, 50 independent third-party candidates elected to the House of Representatives, the People's House, and, uh, and one for, you know, one representing each state, you know. Uh, yeah, they would, they would not know what to do. They wouldn't. They absolutely would not. It, that, that would be so disruptive to the status quo. Uh, I mean, it, were that to happen, I think that the Libertarian they Party... They would be like a deer caught in the headlights. Yeah, I mean, the Libertarian Party at that point could just snap a collar around the neck and just start leading people around. I mean, they, they just, they would absolutely not know how to react. But, and this is the thing, is, you know, we used to be, and a lot of people, uh, oh, I was talking to Craig Gable, maybe, I don't remember who it was, he says, oh, it was Cole Carlin. He said, I don't remember hearing about the Libertarian Party uh, in the 1950s and 60s and like this, and I said, well, we didn't, we didn't have that. There were young Libertarians. Hey, uh, but, just for a but we, Thomas, just for a protective procedure, I'm just going to stop and pause this real quick. I'm going to start it right up again. That's that part's saved. Just so in case something happens and and it's, we wouldn't have to redo the whole thing. So go go ahead and uh, th thank you, sir. Uh, we're right back. All right. Okay. So uh, anyhow, the um, I said, well, there, we didn't have that. You know, David Nolan started the Libertarian Party in 1971. Not he alone, but. Um, you know, he said, if President Nixon uh, signs the bill that was put before him, and I think it was regulating the uh, issuance of currency from the private Federal Reserve Bank system. Yeah, when he and broke he said, the Bretton Woods agreements, basically. Yep. Yeah. And he said, uh, if that happens, 
I'm going to form my own party, and you know we're going to get a president elected that can do that isn't Nixon that can do something. And uh, Nixon signed that, and the next day, uh, David Nolan began the process of, of forming the Libertarian Party. And I think a lot of people were surprised. They were like, "You were serious about that?" You know, I mean, because they were just in the front room of the guy's house at the time, and they were just kind of, you know, kicking around Libertarian ideas. You know, so here we are, 41-year-old party. We're new, we're young, and we had uh, Lyndon LaRouche, we had Bob Barr, and guys like this that are members of the party. But in 2012, you know, now we're the party of Gary Johnson and Judge Gray and Thomas Jefferson and like this. And it's, it's, it's different than it was. And, it's, and I think it's because that we're, it's evolved. I mean, if you look at, if you go to lp.org and look at the 10 platforms, there's stuff, they, they didn't pick stuff that's divisive. They put stuff that pretty much everyone can agree on, I, I think, um, I believe. And um, and uh, and if you, you can also see the list of all the candidates on there, and there are hundreds, I mean, maybe almost a thousand. I mean, lots of candidates and tons of offices, and, and we can definitely get in there. And I would say, you, you know, the same thing, like, I've been, trying to interview people that um, are in a district where they don't have any other third party competitors or independents. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if you're a Green Party person, I mean, you, you should support someone who's going to um, break the paradigm um, and, y you know, stop uh, frivolous wars per se um, and, and spending our time and energy and, and, and lives on on things besides stuff that um, y y we, we, I mean, we should have some self-esteem. I mean, we should elect representatives that represent us. If we had, like, uh, if a movie star had an agent that represented them the same way our Congress has been representing us, I mean, they might be a nice guy, but, I mean, y you know, it's time to fire them and, and get someone new. I mean, this is real serious here. I mean, I guess people don't, are there, we, we need to see, like, what the possibilities are and, 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 and expect a little bit more. I mean, and, 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 and you know, I broaden our sights out a little bit. Um, but, um, well, now, Thomas, I, I just got about 10 more minutes here, sir, but I, there's two questions I want to ask. Well, I mean, one thing is, I mean, if there's anything we left out, I want you to bring it up. Um, and actually, um, let, let me ask you that first real quick. Is there any points that, uh, you, you know, you feel like you want to make to um, the, the people out there who are going to choose who's going to be the next uh, uh, person representing them in your district? Wow. Well, uh, again, like I say, I'm not big into ne negative campaigning because I want people to vote for the person, not the party. And I don't want anyone... I want it to be may the best man win rather than the lesser of two evils. But um, the guy I'm running against is a lawyer and Ivy League guy and all of that. The majority of our house is that. And he's a multimillionaire, hangs out with billionaires, goes over and has dinner with them and whatever. And I don't think that he is as connected to the actual problems that we're facing. Uh, you know, and I have to go to work every day and do my job and support my family. And I'm more in this economy, I think, than a multimillionaire that hangs out with billionaires that lives in, you know, uh, $899,000 house. It's just, you know, I mean, it's he's got... He just doesn't have the same problems that we're, that the rest of us are facing. He's not quite enough. in touch. I mean, th there were people who did vote for the NDA now, not m enough to, to, to defeat it. But, I mean, but there were people who knew that it was a wrong thing to do, that it, that knew it would violate their oath. And, and we need more people like that. Um, I mean, that's just one issue, but that's, I mean, a foundational constitutional issue. Um, and uh, I don't think it should be forgotten. Um, that's... Uh, you, you know, right from the vaults of um, Stalin, basically. Right, right. The NDA, indefinite detention. Um, there sh shouldn't even be a chance of that for an American citizen. And um, I'd, it, hey, Patriot Act? You yeah, were the, talking about the, the, Patriot the, 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 the true Patriot, Patriot Acts were the people who voted against it, which was, you know, another handful. So, But the Patriot Act and the Patriot Act to the second Patriot Act and then the most recent renewing of the NDAA in March of 2012. We need to start undoing the damages that were caused by those things because they uh, they go against uh, the Declaration of Independence, the 
the United States Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and the Articles of the Confederation, which are the documents that are the basis for our federal government. And the, these things just destroy those documents like they don't even care about them. Anyway, have some confidence in our um, in our principles that made this country great. After all, I mean, it's it's like um, you know people wandering forty years in a de de desert or whatever. They 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 never um, they they de never got it, um, <laughs> you know. But uh, so I, I mean, I think people do get it. People do have a choice. Um, I mean, it's not like you know third. I mean, we're not obligated to the Republicans and Democrats. They're definitely not obligated to us. And that's, that's the thing. We're obligated to the United States, the Constitution. I mean, even the people that didn't take three oaths, I mean, that's another, like, biblical thing that, you know, he denied the Constitution, like, three times. Um, the, Constitution, the Constitution went to Mike and said, you will deny me three times. Right. right exactly. Uh, so, I, I mean... I, 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 I yeah. felt like at that time that we, that we were living in the USSA. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was Orwellian. I mean, it's it's when, when it was passed on December 31st, just like you know the Federal Reserve Act was, like in the middle of the yeah. night when no one was paying attention and they're all at their New Year's Eve parties and stuff, um, uh, celebrating the you know the Titanic uh, hitting the iceberg. And yeah. Uh, so it it you know I I believe in America. I believe in our Constitution. I I love it. And um, so. Uh, another question is, I've been asking a lot of the candidates here, because it also gives a perspective. I mean, it might sound kind of an elementary question, but I don't think it is. I think it's something that gives a perspective on, on what you think. I would like to ask, who are some of your favorites? Um, people in the past um, uh, that uh, either presidents or um, politicians or, or just, you know, uh, people that weren't politicians? Uh, Nikola Tesla was not a politician. One of my favorite guys. Yeah, Nikola Thomas Tesla. Jeff Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was a uh, politician. By the way, I don't Sounds know like if a you're good pick. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually filed a name change so that Thomas Jefferson would be on the ballot. My name was not Thomas Jefferson at birth. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for letting us know that. But, that, yeah, but, but he's going to be there in spirit, right? Yeah, and that's the thing, is that that was what I wanted. Um, I wanted Thomas Jefferson to be back on the ballot, and that's kind of, brilliant. Yeah. Well, well, a part of the reason because here is the thing: we started the Thomas Jefferson Project, which was to vote the person, not the party. And the one of the goals for the Thomas Jefferson Project was to get Thomas Jefferson on the ballot. And it turned out that really to do that, the way to do it was that somebody, one of our Libertarian Party of Kansas, somebody here would have to take on this charge of responsibility. And so I decided that I was just going to commit and, and do the thing. And that, yeah, I mean, it's kind of been, it's upset my life a little bit, but it, it's nothing compared to what. See, the actual real Thomas Jefferson. So there is an urgency, um, I mean, to this. It's not like we, you know, um, let's not yeah. put off tomorrow that we can do today. Do today right? yeah. But the real Jefferson was, um, uh, you know, he could have been... Um, killed by slow torture by King George for treason, for writing. Yeah, so when people are worried that this is going to corrupt you, I mean, you're saying you're already in the game. I mean, so, I mean, if, if, if people are worried about that, the, the, it's, 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 it's beyond that point. I mean, I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you're in it to win it. And, um, and, and the stuff that, the stuff, the actual Thomas Jefferson, he was literally on pain of death the stuff he was doing. I mean, here, we're just people are going to make fun of you and not vote for you or whatever. It's going to be nothing. You might lose an election. But I mean, they had to fight a revolution. We can have a revolution yeah. a lot easier by just we voting. All, we, can do, we can do it with Twitter. We can have a revolution with Twitter. You don't, you don't even have to look. You can have the revolution while you're driving your car, pull over the side, tweet something, start a revolution. That's the technology we live with today. It's different. You can do it in the air conditioning. Exactly. I mean, it, it, that's that's the legacy that was given to us, um, and, uh, and and so hopefully something that we'll earn as well and be able to hand off in a better situation for our future. I mean, isn't that what a lot of this is about? And um, 
and, and building on uh, on the building on the good things of the past, learning from history, not making the same mistakes. I mean, it, you know, it, we did have slavery in the past, and that wasn't good. So we're not going to we you know champion things like that. Of course, I mean, far from it. So, I mean, everything opposed to that. So, I mean, the future. Um, is uh, yet to be written. Uh, I mean, so we. I mean, that's what I believe. I mean, if you think it's already written, then, um, then I guess, we, we, yeah. We have we have slavery today. There is actual physical slavery still in the world today, uh, in places. But uh, another Jeffersonian ideology was um, physical slavery requires that you house and feed the enslaved. And remember when he turned four his father died and he inherited land that had slaves already on it when he got married his wife's father's dowry estate that came into him through the marriage had slaves so he wound up owning 200 slaves but at the time that was just part of the thing if you had land you had slaves yeah and some people were against i mean george washington did free and benjamin franklin was an abolitionist so i mean a lot of our founding fathers were conscientious of it john adams had some thoughts and Je jefferson that. kind of felt like you didn't want to be a slave in the united states but more than that you didn't want to be a freed slave in the united states because the opportunities were even much worse he freed two slaves uh, during his, well, first of all, two slaves escaped uh, the plantation when he received the estate from his wife's father, and he opted to not pursue them. Then he freed two others because they were skilled tradesmen, and they could read and write, and they could uh, plain wood, and they could build frames, and so they had a vocation. Yeah, and he was a man too. I mean, he, he is kind of more than a man to 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 us in the United States. But, but but the same that doesn't take away anything about um, you, you know the principles that he wrote. I mean, even right. Frederick Douglass acknowledged like the Constitution is one of the most beautifully written um, things. I mean, it doesn't take away from that at all. And I think actually one good constitutional amendment that would. Um, uh, be be, be just one sentence. Just wherever it says man, it, it should mean um, people, regardless of um, race, um, gender, uh, uh, well, whatever, every, everything else. I mean, it should just if, if you're a free, conscious, thinking individual, then this applies to you, and not just quote unquote men. That's what men actually means, and that that would be it. But the 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 physical slavery that was apparent at the time of Jefferson required that the slave owner house and feed the enslaved. Economic slavery requires the enslaved to house and feed themselves. And that's what we're seeing today with the disparagement between the wealthiest 1% oh, that's and the poorest 1%. And it, even it, tacking on to that in the civil rights movement, talking about the slave mind, I mean, um, just the fact that people think they have to vote for a Democrat or Republican, I mean, true freedom is... Um, is free to 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 um, to express yourself and not, not really as long as it doesn't step on anyone else's toes. Uh, right. Worry about what others think. Um, I mean, free to be yourself uh, to to your own pursuit of happiness. Um, you, you know, and uh, so I mean that that's um, part of the, the the age of enlightenment, the Renaissance. I mean, hopefully we you know it's we can we, we, Renaissance is not guaranteed, but we can definitely create, you know, the atmosphere for one to grow. And, um, well, Thomas, I, I have, I, it's been a pleasure, and um, I, I, I really enjoy talking to you. I think, um, you, you know, we've gotten to know you a little bit, and uh, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, substance here, and, 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 and not, not just style, although um, smart style by, you know, Thomas Jefferson being on the ballot, and um, I appreciate it, your it made, That made an impact, by the way, having Thomas Jefferson on the ballot here, because I was the Libertarian candidate um, on the ballot. We, the ballot, we weren't, it wasn't done yet, we hadn't had our state convention, and we hadn't turned the list into the Secretary of State yet, and it was actually, I had given a speech to our former chairman here, Dan Regan, a speech that I had given a couple times. It's a red, white, and blue speech where you have red states and blue states, but the country's red, white, and blue. And he said, that was a great speech. What was your name again? And that's when I said, you know, we need to use the name Thomas Jefferson 
like an actual person in the Thomas Jefferson project. Oh, I, I totally dig it. I think it's uh, it's like I said, it's brilliant. And um, I mean, so this new wave that we can um, we together as a f in a sense um, a family of uh, people who believe in the Constitution. Um, uh, you, you know, who believe, uh, who tr you know, there are still people, I guess, that believe. I mean, the founding fathers were idealistic. They, they truly believed, and, and they did study up on history. And, and so, I mean, they're very thoughtful in what they wrote. Um, they, they try to think things through. And uh, and it, what more thing could be appropriate to have, um, you, you know, 21st century Thomas Jefferson right in there with us? Yeah. So, um. So Anyhow, it, it made it. I mean, we, 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 every, we have set um, milestones in each phase of this project, and we've hit each one. And you're, you're contributing to our, we're in the second phase right now, which is, third phase is canvassing, that starts in September. So the second phase is uh, media outlets, getting the voice heard, getting the name out there. Yeah, and, and so we expect to see in the debates um, anyone who would deny the debates um, are denying the people their choice and, and should be um, uh, voted out of office immediately. And, um, well, Thomas, I, it's, it's been a pleasure. I, I, I will say goodbye to you after this uh, interview real quick. And, um, but uh, th thank you again, and, um, and, and Godspeed. Thank you. Thanks, sir.